What's up, boxing fans? Welcome to episode number 124 of The Neutral Corner. I am Michael Montero for Boxing Monthly Magazine and BoxingMonthly.com, coming to you from the East Coast, the Eastern time zone of the USA. We have finally gotten across the country to Atlanta. Uh, Tiffany and I took off about a week and a half ago from Los Angeles. We took our time getting out here. Been here for a few days, but uh, just getting everything set up, you know, it's taken a while. Finally got the studio set up and getting things together. We still got a long, long way to go. We're set up in an apartment right now. Uh, down the line, of course, we'll, we'll get a house, and that's when uh, I can really, really put together the studio I want. But right now, got things up and running from Atlanta, Georgia, and it's just been crazy rainy here since we got here. I guess there's a tropical storm that's coming up through the Gulf of Mexico right now, and that's affecting us. It's just been uh, hot and rainy. Actually, not that hot. Probably in the 80s or something, so not that bad. Anyway, you guys aren't listening to this to get a weather report. You're listening to this for boxing. Um, and it, speaking of boxing, uh, well, I'll get to it in some news and notes, but there's a fight coming up in this part of the world that Tiffany and I will be covering ringside. I'll talk about that in just a second. But first, wanted to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, Boxing Tech just increased his pledge on Patreon and Raul El Catracho Sarmiento uh, just joined the team. He's a new pledge on Patreon. Thank you to you guys, both of you, and to all of our Patreon supporters. Can't thank you guys enough. All right, that's it for the intro. Let's get into some news and notes. We got a lot to catch up on. So much news and notes, in fact. I might do another... Uh, I guess a split episode where we do part one, that's just do's and notes, and then part two will be the rest of it. So let's get right into it, news and notes. Okay, as I just alluded to, there is a fight coming up in New Orleans, another t another uh, top rank on ESPN card, where Regis Progre will fight an Argentinian fighter, Juan Jose Velasco, in New Orleans, I can't remember the name of the venue off the top of my head, but of course we got some time, we'll talk about this. New Orleans is maybe, I think, a six hour drive from Atlanta. So Tiff and I, and during our drive out here from LA, we stopped in a bunch of cities and checked them out, and New Orleans was one of them. Uh, people, you were telling us about you know the humidity and everything in Atlanta, it's so crazy, but man, the humidity in New Orleans and Houston on a different level. Atlanta seems mild right now after going through those two cities. But anyway, uh, Pro Gray, who really, really looks like he might be the goods at 140 pounds. Uh, he's going up against Velasco in New Orleans. And uh, Teofimo Lopez, I think, also is fighting on that card. So we're going to be down there. So any of you guys in that part of the country, if you can make it out to New Orleans for that fight, Check out that fight. I think it's going to be... I mean, look, Pro Gray looks to be a real talent. I think it'll be fun to check him out live. I haven't seen him fight live yet. I haven't covered one of his fights. So I'm looking forward to it. But this will be a new venue I haven't been to. It's a city I've only been to once. And like I said, Tiff and I just went through there. We stayed one night. We checked it out. We walked Bourbon Street. We actually went to a strip club. It was kind of funny. It was like a Tuesday night. And we saw the Tuesday night talent. <laughs> Not so good, man. Not so good. But, uh, yo, we'll be there July 14th for that top rank on ESPN show. And any of you guys who can make it out, let me know. We'll chat. Maybe we can uh, get a meetup together or something like that. I believe my homie Steve Kim will be making the trip from L.A. to cover that fight. I'll find out for sure. But, uh, yeah, we might, we might need to meet up and, and do, do Bourbon Street, man. All right, so the big, big news recently has been the drama, the seemingly never-ending drama between Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin. So this whole thing blew up, right? You guys know the story. It's been rehashed a billion times about Canelo uh, popping twice. And by the way, uh, in the next issue of Ring Magazine, there will be my first Ring Magazine piece in the actual magazine that's coming up in the next issue. And it will be an all-encompassing piece about the whole Clint Buterall scandal, top to bottom, a timeline of events, what happened. I talked to uh, several people involved with that case for that story. So you guys, when that comes out, let me know what you think. I'm excited that um, I'm going to be in the following episode or episode issue of Ring Magazine as well. I did a piece on uh, 
prospect out of Wichita, Kansas, Nico Hernandez, who is an American Olympian, medaled for America in the last Olympics for boxing. And who knows if we're even going to have boxing in the upcoming 2020 Olympics. We'll talk more about that later. But anyway, so I'm going to be in two straight issues of Ring Magazine. But I bring up Ring Magazine uh, because I'm going to start with this Canelo Golovkin madness. Um, it, it, everything is just the wheels have completely fallen off, but I can't even start with that without talking about the ring magazine middleweight championship, which should have, it should be vacant right now. However, the brass at golden boy promotions, which owns ring magazine, obviously did not want that to happen. And I know I talked about this a little bit, uh, in previous episodes. I don't remember how much of it I covered. But guys, for months, you, you know I'm on the ring ratings committee. And I've been saying for a while now, hey man, this guy failed a drug test. He needs to be stripped. There were people like Mike Coppinger, let's say, who, who did not want to strip him. Because his rationale was that, well, they're going to probably rematch Triple G and Canelo in September. And I want that rematch to be for the Ring Magazine Championship. I vehemently disagree with that. And I know Doug Fisher, the editor of Ring Magazine, vehemently disagrees, as does most of the other Ring Ratings Committee. But bottom line, even guys like Cop got on board at, at the end once he was suspended by NSAC and said, look, we got to strip this dude. We got to strip him. He's suspended right now. He's not allowed to fight until August 17th. This guy should not even be in the ratings. And Fisher, Doug, he wanted it. The ring ratings committee, almost unanimously, wanted it. We sent it up to the brass at Golden Boy, the parent company. And I can't go on record with all of it, but I'm just going to say, where does the buck stop? Think about it this way, guys. There's a fall guy right now that's being used on social media and stuff uh, with this whole situation. But where does the buck stop at Golden Boy when it comes to Canelo? I'm just going to give you two letters, okay? E and G. I'm just going to put it right there. Those folks refused to strip Canelo Alvarez. That's it, okay? That's coming from me. I ain't coming from nobody else. I'm going to go ahead and put it out there because these people don't like me anyway. So that's the reality. Ring Magazine has lost all remaining credibility it once had with its titles in this situation. I, I cannot defend it. And by the way, Doug Fisher is in a horrible spot here because he needs to feed his kids. He needs to keep his job. And he was basically in a position where he fought tooth and nail with the brass, with the folks in charge that... Canelo has to be stripped, but it was pretty much to a point where like, dude, you could lose your job. So fall in line. So you guys saw what Doug wrote about. I think he wrote about it in his mailbag and he's responded on Twitter and me, him and I have talked about it over the phone and he knew he was going to get pounded. It's not on him guys. Don't bring any of this to Doug Fisher. Don't bring any of it to ring magazine. It's, it's with golden boy. And Golden Boy Promotions, I got to say, they're great to work with, with all of their fighters. If you need access to a guy, you can get access to him. Uh, if you're trying to do an interview, if you're trying to write an article, a video even, right? You guys have seen the stuff I've done with like Joseph Diaz Jr. And, and, you know, guys like that. But when it comes to Saul Canelo Alvarez, they are a different company. And it's because this guy is basically their meal ticket. He is how they're staying above water, pretty much, and making very, very good money. It's him. And he is basically, uh, I don't know what the right word is, supplying the funds to do some of the other things Golden Boy's doing. Now, they do fine on other shows. They do just fine. But as far as being a power broker, type of promoter, one of the power promoters that's up there with like a top rank, that's up there with Eddie Hearn, those kind of guys. It's Canelo that keeps Golden Boy there. There's really nobody else that's even close to that in their stable. And Canelo Alvarez is 
kind of pissed off at Golden Boy right now. Again, this is just me talking, okay? This is this is coming from Michael Montero. This isn't coming from anybody else. I don't want this to be taken out of context as uh, quoted from anybody else but me, okay? This is just me talking here. Canelo Alvarez is not happy with Golden Boy because he feels he wasn't taken care of in this situation as it relates to Nevada State Athletic Commission being suspended the whole nine because Canelo is a Mexican guy who lives in Mexico and that's not how things happen down there. If you're the superstar athlete, if you're one of the premier brands in that country, you don't get suspended. You don't get suspended for a couple of uh, clenbuterol positive tests, especially when you, you have things like the hair follicle sample to fall back on, the history of contaminated meat. There's enough open to question there where you walk. Now, other fighters of lesser value, other athletes, other celebrities and stars of lesser value, yeah, they might get suspended. But Saul Alvarez does not get suspended. That is not the way business is done down in Mexico. So he is pissed off right now that this happened. Uh, I talked to Bob Bennett, of all people, and, and several other people related to that. And again, I can't get into too much of it. I, I don't want to reveal too much until that story comes out in Ring Magazine. But they were in a spot where they were prepared to extend that six-month suspension and make it longer. Because Golden Boy and some of the people involved on that side were upset about that suspension and complained a little bit. And they're fortunate, and Bob Bennett actually went on the record with that. He told me I could, I could state this publicly. He said, look, they're fortunate they only got six months based on everything that happened. So, all right, anyway, uh, ranting too much about that. Let's get to what's happened recently, okay? Over this weekend, everything just fell apart. It looked like things were pro progressing well. On Tuesday, May 15th, Canelo announced that he was enrolling in year-round testing with VADA. And subsequent to that, Triple G said basically he's just going to continue doing the testing with VADA that he signed on to do with the originally scheduled Canelo rematch. I think that was on 522. They stated that. So from uh, May 15th and May 22, both of these guys are involved in VADA testing, okay? And this is, you know, again, different than the WBC's clean boxing program, which, you know, is funded by the BC, their budget. No, no, no. This is being paid for by the fighters. This is budgeted through them um, for Canelo will probably run 20 grand a year, maybe more. Um, and for Golovkin, about 20 grand a year. The only reason to be a little bit more for Canelo is because of the logistics involved, him living in Mexico and all, okay? It, the, the, the prices from Vada is, is the same across the board. It's just the logistics, if you live in different parts of the world, might cost a little bit more to send uh, test samples and all that back and forth, okay? So everything looks good, right? But then apparently Triple G gives Tom Loeffler a call and says, you know what, 65-35 split for this rematch is bullshit considering everything that took place with the failed test the suspension the back and forth even negotiating the rematch and all of it f that i want 50 50. and then loffler went back to golden boy with that and golden boy and canelo told them what they can do with that stick it up their ass so now according to oscar de la hoya triple g is making ridiculous demands and the, the, the split for the first fight was 70-30, okay? And then both guys are getting foreign TV money. I believe there was some pay-per-view upside as well, but that was mostly on the Canelo side. 65-35 for the rematch, um, which I thought was very generous of Golovkin and his side to accept. They're only getting 5% more. But considering that one fighter failed to test and is suspended by the premier authority... Of, of boxing in the world, the Nevada State Athletic Commission, not just boxing, but all fight sports. They do UFC too. They do everything, right? They are the premier commission. That So when they suspend you, that's, that's it. You ain't fighting. Uh, I, I don't think wanting more than 35% suddenly because your, your plans got on hold and everything else, your career is on hold right now. I don't think that's a crazy demand. Now, 50-50? There's no way Golovkin's getting 50-50. And he knows that. And Loeffler knows that. Their entire side knows that. But how do negotiations work? 
You start big and then you work it down, right? That's how negotiations work. I think this whole 50-50 thing, this is Triple G trying to get himself up to 40% of the split, which I think is more than fair. You guys got to remember, and some of you are saying, oh, well, Golovkin could have fought Billy Joe Saunders. He could have fought Derevyanchenko uh, instead of Marta Rosian. Okay, he could have done this, that, or the other thing. Number one, a fight with Saunders is, is we've, you know, that's a dead horse that you know, we can beat the hell out of. But let's just say that Nevada would approve it and it could have worked out in June. Let's just say, okay? It wouldn't have been a pay-per-view success because there wouldn't have been enough time to promote it properly and all that stuff. But again, devil's advocate, let's say he fights Saunders in June instead of Martyrosian. Or let's say he fights Derevyanchenko. Let's say, like, you know, let's pretend that they're actually wanting that fight in May. Let's say a, 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 a rematch with Jacobs, any of those guys, none of them bring anywhere near the financial capital that a Canelo rematch brings, right? And Golovkin and his side, they were wanting that rematch in May. That's what they signed on for. So Canelo's not the only one losing out with an eight-figure payday with that rematch not happening in May. So was Golovkin. So he, you know, I think is deserved of some financial compensation here. But even if you don't feel he deserves any of that and you think that's bullshit, fine. Considering that one guy is active and has never failed a drug test and the other guy has failed that one, but two of them is suspended. And it's very, very arguable. I don't even think it's arguable that Golovkin won the first fight. That's the consensus of most fans and media and boxing insiders and pundits around the world. I don't think it's that damn out of question to want more than a 35% split. I don't give a shit how much money either of these guys get. I'd like to see the fight again, but I understand this tactic. Of course, people on Twitter now, people on social media, all the idiots on these YouTube channels that you guys send me links to. <laughs> I don't want to watch these videos and give them a click. Sometimes I can't help myself though. The headlines are too damn hilarious. You know what they're all saying. Now Golovkin's ducking. Uh, and, and now people are bringing up the Andre Ward shit from 2015. Or was that 2015? Or was that 2014? I can't even remember. They're bringing up Billy Joe Saunders, I think, in 2016. And, and how that fell through. And there's all these excuses going back and forth. And people are trying to conflate situations and compare them, even though they're completely different and years apart. The people that are doing this have agendas. You guys know this. We've been over that. But here's the thing. Oscar De La Hoya, Eric Gomez, they know those people with agendas out there exist. And they're using them right now to get away with doing the rematch right away. Let me read you a quote from Oscar De La Hoya. This is an actual quote. I'm not paraphrasing here, okay? Oscar says, it's clear to us that Golovkin doesn't want to fight Canelo. So we're going to move on and I'm going to start making calls to Daniel Jacobs people, Billy Joe Saunders people, start making calls to Jamal Charlo and Spike O'Sullivan. It's fine. Go and deal with your IBF mandatory, whoever he is. I believe he has 11 fights. Go deal with him. Make a million and a half. Good luck. There's no better deal for him out there for a fight with anybody. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there. Most of it's pure, unadulterated bullshit. The first sentence, it's clear to us that Golovkin doesn't want to fight Canelo. And he also went on to say, uh, Golovkin's scared to lose to Canelo. Then what the F was the first fight all about? What the F was two years almost of chasing you guys around for a fight about? Clearly this guy is not afraid to fight you. They were ready to sign on for the rematch immediately. They wanted to announce the rematch and get it going immediately after the first fight. No one is scared to fight Canelo. Well, there are fighters who are scared to fight Canelo. Golovkin isn't. So let me be clear about that statement. It's clear Golovkin's not afraid to fight Canelo. So that statement is stupid. And then there's no better deal for him out there for a fight with anybody. Now, he's not... Oscar isn't very specific with who, you know, there's, there's no better deal for him out there 
Compared to Canelo, yes, that's true. The Canelo fight is the biggest payday. But guess what, Oscar? That goes both ways. To, to insinuate, though, and that's what I think Oscar was trying to do here, that there's no other big money fight for, uh, for Golovkin out there except for Canelo. Well, that's pure bullshit. And Oscar knows that. There's a fighter in Japan, Ryoto Murata. I've been tweeting about this. I've been talking about this because Loeffler already has his eyes set on a potential fight with him. This guy owns a piece of the WBA title. At some point, he's going to be in line for a uh, basically a mandatory type fight with Golovkin, the same way Daniel Jacobs was. At some point, the WBA is going to mandate that anyway. This dude does... Eight-figure viewership in his country. For his last fight against the journeyman, I believe the, the, the number was 17 million Murata did in Japan. His rematch with Hassam Nadam did a global rating of over 30 million people. I'm talking live, okay? 30 million to watch him fight Hassam Nadam. In his own country, 17 million against the journeyman. A stay busy fight. Against Gennady Golovkin, and I've gone on the record saying this, and I don't stutter when I say it, even though some people think it's blasphemous. A Triple G Murata fight, especially, there's a tradition in, in uh, Tokyo. They do annually, they do these New Year's Eve cards on December 31st. They do it every year. It's a big thing over there, and they enjoy it. It's just part of their boxing heritage there. A fight between Golovkin and Murata, any date, but especially during that uh, New Year's Eve tradition over there, that is the biggest boxing event in Japanese boxing history. And yes, I'm including when Buster Douglas shocked the world against Mike Tyson some 30 some years, you know, almost 30 years ago, right? It's bigger than that. And some people think, no, no, there's no way this is bigger than that fight. Yes, it is. Number one, that was seen as a stay busy blowout fight for Tyson. It ended up having a huge global impact. But this is an event would feature a Japanese quote unquote champion. He's really just a mere titleist and a, a piece of a titleist, but a former Olympian, a former Olympic medalist, I believe is the only middleweight titleist Japan's ever had, going up against the legitimate middleweight champion of the world, Gennady Golovkin, a star in the sport. This is huge. This would be massive. This would bring Gennady Golovkin an eight-figure payday. If you don't think so, then you don't know shit about boxing and the business of it, and you think too narrow-mindedly. You think nothing exists outside of America when it comes to the sport. Guess what? There are other markets throughout the world where boxing is very, very big. And a big event like that over in Tokyo brings Golovkin eight figures. Does it bring him Canelo Alvarez money? No. But does it dwarf Derevyanchenko money, Charlo money, Jacobs rematch money? Any of those guys? Yes. The only other guy out there that I think can compete possibly would be Billy Joe Saunders. I think that could actually be a pretty big fight if it was promoted and built up properly. And don't get me wrong about Charlo. If he actually beats a ranked, worthwhile middleweight and really starts creating some buzz, and look, he's already a mandatory for one of Golovkin's titles, but there's no buzz for that fight outside of diehard fight fans. But he could build that up if he goes on a winning streak. But right now, he doesn't bring eight figures. None of those guys do. And Saunders, I don't think, does either. But that's a big fight because it brings another title. And if that fight's promoted properly, I think that it could do pretty respectable numbers, even here in the United States, not just in the UK. But regardless, Murata is a huge option for Golovkin. And Oscar De La Hoya and his people know this. So for him to make a statement like that, like there's no other big fight out there for him, it's stupid. It's just ridiculous. It's just stupid. Okay. Where can I, where can I stop on this? Uh, I feel like I've covered all the bases here. I feel like we're going to be talking about this more so. Um, I'm probably going to, I was going to give Tom Loeffler a call today. I reached out to him over the weekend. He said he's around, but then I realized today, Monday, at the time I'm recording this, it's Memorial Day. It's a holiday. I don't want to bother Tom today. I will give him a call later this week 
and see if I can get any updates on the situation. But look, man, I, I do understand to a degree if Canelo doesn't want to come right back off of a layoff and fight Golovkin in a rematch. He might want a tune-up fight in September. That's understandable. If that's your plan, though, just tell Golovkin and his team now. And not for Golovkin's sake. Like, because a lot of you out there would say he doesn't owe Golovkin that. And you know what? You're right. But for the fans' sake. And Canelo does owe the fans. He owes a lot of people right now. He's screwed up, guys. He screwed up big. Regardless of how you feel the Clembuterol got in the system, he screwed up. So he does owe fans. He does owe the sport right now. He owes everybody. He should come out. And if your plan in September, and, and Golden Boy already said he's coming back September 15th. Okay. If your plan is to come back and fight Spike O'Sullivan, which is probably who it's going to be, announce it. And say, look, we're going to, I know you can't make the fight official just yet. I, I, I realize that, guys. But say that we are not going to fight Golovkin in a, an immediate rematch. We are going to do a tune-up fight and give a short list of opponents. And you know what? HBO could probably do that on regular HBO. It would be along the lines of when Golovkin fought, Mar fought Martirosian, right? It's basically going to be that level of matchup. Okay, fine. Just announce that so the fans know what to expect. For Golovkin and his team, they can move forward and schedule something with a Billy Joe Saunders. Or maybe it's the Rev Yunchenko to, the, to the take care of that mandatory. Whatever. Maybe they can come back and fight in August or something. And then if they want to do the New Year's Eve fight against Murata in Tokyo, which by the way, if that does happen this year, I'll see his ringside because I'm going to that. I'm not missing that event for the world. I've never been to Tokyo. That would be amazing. But Golovkin could get his three fights in. And the fight with, let's, let, let's say it is Saunders. Let's say he, he tells uh, the IBF, thanks but no thanks. I'm going to fight Saunders to unify titles. I'll fight for the IBF again later. Let the Revianchenko have it. Let's just say, let's say Canelo and his side say, you know what, we're going to come back do a tune-up in September. Okay, cool. Golovkin ends, ends up fighting uh, Saunders in August, takes his title from him, and then ends up fighting Murata over in, uh, in Tokyo, December 31st. So he gets his three fights in this year. Canelo gets in his tune-up fight, and boom, they do the rematch next May. I think that's fine. Everybody, uh, I'm not going to say everybody wins, but I think that that would work out. I think all that would work out. But the people involved got to start talking. Now, I, I, you know, it's funny because I go from a, a Canelo apologist to a Golovkin apologist and back and forth. I'm a shill for Golden Boy or for Tom Loeffler, depending on what day of the week it is. But right now, I'm going to be accused of being just a straight up Triple G biased lover and a Canelo hater and blah, blah, blah. But I don't give a shit. At this point in time, Golovkin and Loeffler are making their positions very, very clear and very, very understandable. They're talking about potential fights with Rayona Re Murata, potential plans and everything. And they mean what they say. They're not just throwing it out for bullshit. Uh, Golovkin wants more money for the rematch with Canelo. They're making it clear that they want to fight two or three times this year. Okay, They're moving forward. Canelo, again, we're not hearing from him. He is doing VADA testing, and I applaud him for that. But what are your plans? Are you going to come back and do a tune-up? Do you want to come right back into the Golovkin rematch? What are your priorities? I'm sick of hearing Oscar talk. Oscar's a promoter. Oscar isn't necessarily 100% sober right now and speaking with the clearest state of mind. I don't care what Oscar has to say. And quite frankly, I don't care what anybody at Golden Boy has to say right now. I want to hear what Canelo has to say. What does he want to do? What are his plans? All right, let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about HBO versus Showtime versus ESPN versus DAZN. Now, keeping it just a premium cable here in the United States, HBO's next card, at least the main event, we don't have a co-main scheduled yet, but this, their next card is a good one. Sergey Kovalev fighting Edladir Alvarez, the man who was avoided, I'm not going to say ducked, but avoided by Adonis Stevenson. He was a mandatory for 472 years, and Stevenson continued to 
Just find ways not to fight this dude, even though he's the mandatory. And finally, I don't know what the BC did, but somehow Alvarez isn't the mandatory anymore. And now he's fighting a guy that Stevenson shamelessly ducked, Sergey Kovalev, the former legitimate light heavyweight champion of the world. Good fight, right? Atlantic City, that should be fun. Here's the problem. It's an August, August 4th. That is <laughs> months away from now. You know what I'm saying? HBO doesn't have a fight scheduled until August 4th. Now, I should add to this that Main Events, who's putting on that card, reached out to Floyd Mayweather to see if Badu Jack would be interested in fighting Dimitri Bivol as the co-feature on that card. And Floyd Mayweather and Badu Jack, but mostly Floyd Mayweather, said, hell to the no. They want to know part of that Dimitri Bivol stuff. So um, that would have been a nice co-feature. That ain't happening, but Bivol will probably fight somebody on that card as well. August 4th, guys. August 4th. Now in Showtime, they have multiple cards throughout that time span between now and then. And they're not all the greatest fights on earth. Errol Spence is fighting a mandatory June 16th in Dallas. But I think that's going to be a fun event because Errol Spence from Dallas is making his homecoming. That's going to be a live, fun event. Showtime has several things coming up in the works, right? ESPN has cards coming up. I think they will have fights on regular ESPN and they will continue to build up the ESPN Plus app. They have fights scheduled to be on that app between now and then. HBO is dead in the water. Now, the situation I talked about before related to Canelo and Golovkin. If Canelo does come back and fight somebody like a Spike O'Sullivan, well, fine, HBO gets Canelo on regular HBO in 2018. I guess that's good for business. And they get Golovkin back on regular HBO on New Year's Eve because his fight with Murata, that would be a, a very, very cheap as far as the licensing fees because that would be a foreign fight. So that would be on regular HBO too. So HBO would save a little face, but pretty shitty year overall and superfly three is coming back in the fall that's going to help them out a little bit but top to bottom showtime is absolutely destroying hbo and it's not just with their regular programming on showtime it's what they do on social media they stream fights on their youtube channel on their social media you can use uh, their app and you, and you can go on online and you can watch their fights. HBO is not offering their subscribers who do come there for boxing anything. And most of you guys are paying, I think, about $15 extra for HBO on your monthly cable bill, an extra 15 bucks. You're not getting your money's worth. If you're subscribing to Showtime for boxing, you're getting your money's worth. And if you have regular cable, ESPN is part of your regular cable package, so you're getting your money's worth when it comes to boxing and these top rank cards. By the way, speaking of those, Lomachenko against Linares, it did an average 1.4 million ratings. And I think it peaked at 1.7 million. Loma's fight against Guillermo Rigondeaux averaged 1.7 million. So the average viewership was down a little bit from the Rigondeaux fight. However, we're in the midst of the NBA playoffs, the NHL playoffs, Major League Baseball's underway. So considering all of that, and the big stars are in the NBA playoffs, right? LeBron James, uh, who's the dude on Golden State? The little dude, uh, Curry, right? These guys are in the NBA playoffs, the big stars. So, I mean, for, for Lomachenko to do that kind of a rating during all that, I think is pretty damn impressive. Valdez Quig did over 1.1 million. Compare that to Mungia Ali, which did 700K. Even Golovkin Martirosian did 1.2 million, which is pretty damn respectable. Now, now I get it. HBO's in 32 million homes. ESPN's in 86 million homes. I get it, guys. But all things considered, you have regular cards doing 
good, decent ratings on ESPN and they're building towards something. And even when there's other big time sports programming going on, they're regularly with these cards doing over 1 million homes. That's pretty respectable. That's pretty respectable. If you have HBO right now, it might be time to pull the plug. That $15 a month that you're spending on HBO, you can pull the plug on that. You can order the ESPN Plus app that costs you $5, and you can save $10 a month. I want you to think about every fight that has been on ESPN so far this year. We're not even halfway through the year so far, but Lomachenko Linares, in my opinion, uh, is a very, very good quality fight. But I also thought Valdez Quig was an outstanding fight. There have been a few good ones on ESPN. If you had to pay $5 for those fights, if you paid $5 a month for this app, and each month you get a good boxing card like that. Now, they're not always going to wind up being great fights. You're going to occasionally get duds. You're going to get Lomachenko Rigondeaux, but that was a big matchup. But $5 a month for a fight. Let's say you get one fight from ESPN a month, one fight card. Is it worth $5? If you're getting one card a month on the app, five bucks, think of it as a $5 pay-per-view. Plus, you get access to the top rank library, which they're adding more and more fights to all the time on that app. So you can go back and watch some of your favorite fights from back in the day and all the recent fights. It's all right there on that app. Five bucks a month. Or you can stay with HBO, which once every three months or so gives you a boxing match. And it costs you 15 bucks a month. I don't know, guys. To me, it's not a hard decision. I don't know why some of you are so upset about this ESPN, ESPN Plus app. It's five bucks. And it, it's also more than just boxing. I think can, it'd be one thing if HBO is giving you the same level of quality that Showtime's giving you, but they're not. So ESPN's giving you more than HBO is, and they're a third of the, the price. So I, And you get all those classic fights. You get access to that. And most of you guys now have Apple TV and all that, where if something's on your phone, you can blast it over to your TV, to your big 60-inch TV or whatever, even though it's streaming off your phone. The quality has been great so far, the fights that they've had on the app and all the classic fights and stuff on there. Uh, I, I don't know what you guys are complaining about, man. So, so far, and you know, this is just going to bring me right into the next issue or the next topic I want to discuss Eddie Hearn's deal with the zone. Now, I was, I was going to do a rant video about this, talking more about it in detail, and, and I'll do that, okay? But just right here, I wanted to mention overall, I think this is a good thing. And it poses some issues, some logistical issues, and there could be some problems. And if there was, Certain other people doing this, I'd be more concerned. But it's Eddie Hearn, who for, for some reason people just love to hate this dude. But he delivers a lot of the time. He's not the saint some people make him out to be. But he's not the devil a lot of people make him out to be either. This deal that he has with the Zone and their parent company, bigger rights fees, bigger annual rights fees than HBO and Showtime combined. Now. A lot of you are making comparisons to PBC, which was, and there's some similarities there, but there are huge differences, huge differences. For one, and this, this is stating the obvious, but Eddie Hearn's deal with the zone is on one platform, one, one platform, not 5,000 like the PBC had. I think they're doing 16 shows a year in the UK, they're doing 16 shows a year in the United States. So let's do the math there. That's almost three shows a month. Now, if this app costs 20 to $25, which is what the rumored cost is going to be, somewhere around there, I know that's, a, that's actually a lot of money, right? This isn't a $5 ESPN Plus app, but if you're subscribing to this thing just for boxing, Guys, if you're getting two to three cards a month, 
one from the UK, one from the US, and a second one from either one of those markets a month. Think about it this way. How much do you pay right now for pay-per-views? A pay-per-view in the United States is what? $70 now? Those of you in Canada, you just had to order a pay-per-view to see Adonis Stevenson fight Badu Jack. On paper, maybe that was pay-per-view worthy, but the action in the ring surely didn't suggest that. And I don't, I wouldn't order that pay-per-view. If for $20 a month, you're getting two fight cards, I think that's a pretty good deal. Also, if you have access to the zone which has other sports uh eddie hearn says that there will be some boxing programming type shows and stuff like that uh, i don't you know we don't know the, sp- 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 the specifics of all that yet but it's going to be shows kind of like this one i'm doing right now you know but it'd be studio produced um so they have things in the works but if you're getting that that much content for 20 25 bucks a month so basically you're paying, I don't know, 10 bucks a fight card. Now, I think that's a pretty good deal as long as the fights are good. If the fights are shit, he'll fail. Eddie Hearn will fail. They watched what happened with PBC, which was a failure. They watched what PBC, PBC did wrong. And the few things PBC actually did right. And top rank, they're doing good with their deal with ESPN so far. I think Eddie Hearn's looked at that deal what top rank did right the few things top rank has done wrong so far and he's learning from all that and the big big advantage that he has in this whole endeavor is that he's already established in one of the hottest markets in boxing which is the uk and he's becoming more and more established with the biggest market in boxing in terms of raw dollars the united states and you've got the biggest star in the sport, Anthony Joshua, who likely will not fight on the zone. I'm sure that's they're going to keep him off that to make more money. But he can be a part of the overall package, meaning he could be on programming and shows and things like that on the zone. I think there's a lot of options for him. Uh, and the rumor is that Eddie's going to re-sign AJ pretty soon, I think, for like a hundred plus million dollars. Uh, what it's going to equal to. So there's a lot to love about this. Now, there's some things to be concerned about. I understand. But the comparisons to PBC are just stupid. And they're lazy. It's a lazy way of thinking. By the way, the comparisons with Top Rank and their deal with ESPN to PBC are stupid. And you see how dumb they are by the success they're already having on the platform. And now with the ESPN Plus app coming out, And you have ESPN Deportes, ESPN3, ESPN2, all these different entities, but they're all ESPN. And you see the success they're already having. So these comparisons are lazy. The biggest difference between Eddie Hearn and the PBC deal is that this isn't a hostile takeover. Eddie Hearn's not going to squat on venues, on dates. He's not going to fight with anybody over this bullshit. He can always go back to the UK and do shows. He doesn't have to compete with American promoters. But also, if he gets shit in the UK, he can come over here and do a show in the United States. He's got so many options here. Here's the thing, too. He doesn't have many fighters. He's got enough fighters to continue doing shows in the UK that will do numbers. But a lot of those UK fighters won't do shit numbers here in the United States. They won't won't move the needle slightly. So he's going to have to work with other promoters to make this thing happen. If he doesn't, he fails. So I believe it's a two-year investment with the options for six more years here. So over the first two years, Eddie Hearn's going to have to make up a lot of ground really, really quickly. And it's going to be interesting to see the way this whole thing unfolds. But I don't get the impression that Eddie Hearn's a moron. I get the impression that he grew up in this business He knows what the hell he's doing, and he's building to something here. So I like this deal. Again, for those of you bitching that, oh, another app, I got to pay more money. These apps will never work. Guys, join the 21st century. This is the future of media, not just sports and not just boxing. 
But in a sport like boxing, in a media like boxing that is so global, the only other sport I can think of that is more global, more international, is soccer or football. That's it. Boxing is the most global sport. Think of all the fighters I've talked about in just this little news and notes rant here and all the different countries and parts of the world they come from and all the uh, different markets all around the world that are hot in boxing. This is such a global international sport. Screw TV networks because then you're held down by a certain country or a certain network. When you've got your own app, when you've got your own streaming service, you don't need dates. It doesn't matter if HBO has this date open or not. You don't give a shit. You need a venue that has a date and you need two fighters and you control everything else. Screw the networks. People like HBO, how invested is HBO in boxing right now? I would say not very invested. So when Top Rank, who's been in this business for what, over half a century now, I would think they know what's going on in boxing. I would think that they've been ahead of the curve on several of these you know, game-changing type decisions before and where they've gone with their marketing and their fighters. They were the first to import Latin American fighters and really, really dive into that market. Same thing with Asia. Now they're investing in Eastern European fighters. Now they're moving over to apps. It's part of the deal with the ESPN Plus app. And the deal with ESPN, I should say, was the ESPN Plus app. You think Top Rank doesn't want a part of that? Of course they do. And now Eddie Hearn, he wants a part of that. He's got a network deal back home, Sky Sports. Yeah, everything's cool. But he knows down the line where the future of this business is. And these guys get it. You got to jump on, ladies and gentlemen. Jump on. Adapt or die. That is how the sports world and the business world in general works. Adapt or die. Showtime is adapting. They're reaching out to their subscribers on social media, on YouTube, on platforms like that. HBO is not adapting. They're dying. Cut HBO. Save $15 a month. Order the ESPN Plus app. Order the Zone. If they have shit fights scheduled for a month or two, drop it. When they get fights back on that you like, sign back up. It's that simple. Okay, let's move on. Some other uh, quick flurries here. Donald Trump, half of you just, your asshole just tensed up just by me saying his name. This, this man, he, he invokes such a visceral, visceral reaction in people. I've never seen anything like it. Just saying his name makes people lose their mind. You guys know I did not vote for Donald Trump. I'm not a Donald Trump guy. However, he did something recently that I really liked. He pardoned Jack Johnson. Finally, over a dozen, I believe over a dozen, previous presidents have failed miserably on this issue. If it's not over a dozen, it's a lot. Okay, I can't do the math right now in my head. But many presidents for almost a century now have failed on this issue. But especially recent presidents including the previous administration. Because Senator John McCain and I believe Harry Reid, a Republican and a Democrat, have been pushing for several years in a bipartisan way, no politics involved, no conservative, no liberal, none of that, just let's work together, Republican, Democrat, and get this pardon done. And they tried in vain with the previous administration, it didn't work. And others have tried with previous administrations before that. Didn't work. Finally, with this administration, it gets done. Now, I don't give a shit how it got done. I don't care if Sylvester Stallone picked up the phone and called the president and that's how the ball got rolling. I don't care if that's what it took. I care that it got done. I tweeted about this because I'm happy for the Johnson family. I'm happy for them. I'm happy for boxing. This is a historic thing. It's something, and, and yeah, I, I know, it's just a gesture. And some may see it as an empty gesture, but I guarantee you Jack Johnson's family 
And a lot of fans and admirers of him for being the first black heavyweight champion, they don't think this is an empty gesture. They're happy this happened, including WBC heavyweight titleist Deontay Wilder, who was there. Of course, the WBC, you know, Mauricio Suleiman had to wiggle his ass into the White House. Uh, never, you know, a, a moment that the WBC can't find a way to squeeze themselves in there for a photo op. But Deontay Wilder was there, and this was a big deal for him. And um, again, I don't care how it got done. It got done. I tweeted about this. I tweeted just, hey, man, this is great. Finally, Jack Johnson gets pardoned. He should have never been charged. This is all bullshit to begin with. And a couple of you lost your effing mind and started going on these insane political rants. And I don't think some of you guys realized how extreme you come off when you just have this visceral, uh, mindless, completely emotional reaction to something. And these are from a, a couple guys who I really like who are cool guys to talk to about boxing. But damn, dude, chill. I I didn't I wasn't con condoning some of the other things the dude has said or done or whatever. I was talking about one specific thing and there was no political context in my tweet. It was only about boxing. But because it involved Donald Trump, there was a couple of you on Twitter talking about Hitler, talking about Auschwitz, all the default responses that extremists, political extremists give when the other side is talked about. By the way, this is the exact same thing that happened every time Barack Obama did something. And I'd tweet about it or I'd talk about it with certain people and say, hey man, I like what Obama did here. Good for him. I'm not a huge Obama guy. Yeah, I didn't vote for him. I, I didn't vote in that election, period. But uh, yeah, I, you know, but uh, you know, Cool, he did good here with this. And some people would go nuts and they'd start calling Obama Hitler and blah, blah, blah. Everyone has to bring up Hitler every time somebody that don't like does something. It just, oh my God. And people were calling Deontay Wilder and Uncle Tom. <sighs> so that was a deep breath, which some of you need to take. You need to stop trying to inject your political views into things that have nothing to do with politics as this pardon didn't, you know, being happy about this pardon has nothing to do with politics. There's no left, no right. It doesn't matter. Something good got done that was long overdue. Just be happy and move on. Believe me, when you interject your political opinions on people and they ask you to stop and you continue to do it, and with each message, get further and further more extreme in your position and start bringing up the Third Reich in Auschwitz. I don't think you're going to convert anyone to your side. You're not going to win hearts and minds with that kind of rhetoric. Just leave the politics out of it. Just be happy. Jack Johnson got pardoned. Good for Trump on that one. Okay. <sighs> Some specific news about fighters here. Uh, David Benavidez is looking to leave Samson Boxing and sign with top rank, apparently. Samson Lekowitz uh, says that his contract with Benavidez is good until 2021. This could get ugly. Top rank. Again, as I've said before, they know what they're doing here. I, I don't think they would just jump into this if they didn't have some sort of plan. What's likely to happen is top rank will buy Benavidez's contract from Samson or they'll reach some sort of deal. Top rank has done this before, okay? For those of you saying that it doesn't make sense for, uh, for Benavidez to sign with top rank, you're stupid. It absolutely does. Number one, top ranks has uh, Gilberto Zerdo Ramirez. They have Esquivia Falcao. They have Jesse Hart at 168 pounds. Those are three quality fights right there. One of them would be for the undisputed, or, or I should say, uh, lineal championship at super middleweight. Also, David Benavidez is eventually going to be at 175 at lightweight, probably within his next three or four fights, I would say. Guess who's at light heavyweight? Oleksandr Govajdik, who probably will have the WBC light heavyweight title pretty soon. 
because the WBC has mandated that he's next in line for Adonis Stevenson. And based on what we saw from Adonis Stevenson in his last fight, I think the nail nails him and takes that title. So if you are David Benavidez and you sign with top rank, you get a couple of fights against Falco, Jesse Hart maybe, and then you get to unify for the complete championship against Zerto Ramirez, and then when you move up, you got an eventual fight with the WBC light heavyweight titleist Alexander Gavajdik down the line. That's probably three years down the line maybe. So for the next two or three years, there's enough there to keep this kid busy, and these are big fights, and you're going to be on ESPN. You're going to be in front of 80 million plus people, possibly, right? You're going to be in that many homes, I should say. The WBC has ordered a fight between Benavidez and Anthony Durrell. They say if a deal isn't reached, they'll do a purse bid on June 22nd. I don't know how all these negotiations between Top Rank and Samson Boxing are going to affect that. I would expect that to go to a purse bid on June 22nd. Unless Top Rank comes in with big cash and they outbid everybody. That is very possible. If they're that interested in Benavidez, maybe that's their move. We'll see. Former super bantamweight champion Celestino Caballero was arrested March 10th. He had 10 kilos of blow in his car, apparently. I think half of it was like in the trunk or something, and half of it was in a bag. He was originally sentenced to five years in prison, but he's set to be released from jail and put on, I think, like a community service program for cooperating with law enforcement. So, uh, you know... Wow, he must have fell on hard times. For Celestino Caballero, I remember, man, for a couple of years there, he was a damn good fighter. He won a few titles, I think. I think he unified titles at one point at 122. For him to be in that sort of financial dire straits where he's having to move blow in his car, what the hell did this guy do with his money? And who the hell was promoting and managing his career? And why didn't they guide that career better? That's kind of sad. Carlos Quadras just left rehab. He was in for a couple weeks. Uh, he was citing issues with drugs and alcohol. And if you've seen some of his last few fights, his performances, and you've heard some of the rumors coming out of Mexico, you've heard about this guy's party habits all over the place, and you see how it affected his inconsistent performances in the ring. Hopefully he's got himself together now and he can uh, make a strong push for a nice little comeback because, uh, you know, he really was at his best. Uh, a pretty damn good fighter, one of the best in that uh, super flyweight division. So if he can get himself back in shape, um, he's still got a future. He's definitely got a possible, you know, challenge for a title again, something like that in his future if he can stay straight. Eric Molina, heavyweight, recent uh, title challenger, Eric Molina, tested positive for a prohibited substance after his TKO3 loss to Anthony Joshua in December of 2016. That's right, I said 2016. We're talking about his fight with AJ. Was just recently suspended for two years by the UK, anti, UK anti-doping, UCAD. This test was performed on December 11th, 2016. Why the hell is UCAD acting now? I don't understand. I, I, I don't know. Guys, I've talked about this before. I don't trust USADA fully. I don't trust UCAD fully. Some of you have tried to tell me, no, no, UCAD's good to go. They're good to go. They're not. They have butt effed numerous cases. And I'll point no further than Tyson and Huey Fury as a, as a gleaming, shining example of how incompetent UCAD is. USADA is also incompetent. I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. And they're in business to make money. VADA is the real deal. Is Vada perfect? No one's perfect, but they're the best in boxing, perhaps the best in all of sports, definitely the best in fight sports. UFC did a deal with USADA, okay? And there's major, major issues with performance enhancing drugs in UFC that dwarf the problems in boxing. So Vada's legit, guys. Everybody else is up to question. And it's not to say that Vada isn't up to criticism or questioning. Everybody is. But based on everything I know, everything I've learned, everything I've studied, everybody I've talked to, and every case that we've examined, 
Vada is by far the best in the business in the entire world, planet Earth, and in the world of fight sports. So you had just this latest example with Eric Molina. What the, what the hell, man? Adrian Broner. Ugh, I hate that I'm going to spend more than two seconds talking about this idiot. Offered a three-fight, almost $7 million deal from Eddie Hearn. Called it a slave deal. I tweeted about the absolute idiocy of this. Number one, slaves don't get paid. Number two, he could have used the term like indentured servant, but they don't get paid very well. They're basically glorified slaves. Uh, you know, my ancestors were indentured servants. A lot of you listening, your ancestors were indentured servants and or slaves. If we all go back far enough, we have some of that in our family somewhere. So for a privileged millionaire idiot, and yes, I'm saying privileged, and I know politically that might trigger you because you look at someone like Broner and say, he can't be privileged. The guy at Berkeley University said, shut up. He's privileged. He's spoiled. He's among the privileged 1% of people on planet Earth, regardless of race or nationality. And for him to say something that ridiculously stupid makes me dislike him even more. And as you can tell, I don't like the guy very much anyway. That's all I need to say about Adrian Broner. Last but not least, a bare knuckle fighting championship is happening on June 2nd in the fighting hotbed of Cheyenne, Wyoming at the Cheyenne Ice and Event Center. I just, I saw this, um, it came up in my feed. Actually, I was sent a press release about this and I thought I'd mention it. If any of you are interested in bare, bare knuckle fighting, Apparently, it is a $30 pay-per-view starting at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and it's being produced in 4K. So it's supposed to be awesome clarity, uh, the stream, I guess. Find out more at barednuckle.tv. That is it with this segment of News and Notes. Over an hour. Look, man, it's been a couple weeks, and a lot of shit's happened. So this is part one of TNC. Part two later this week, we'll have my fight reviews of the last couple weeks and the very limited fight preview of what's coming up this week. It's good to be back in action, and uh, I'll see you at the fights.